for the discovery of new radioactive elements and for your discovery of nuclear reactions affected by slow neutrons, I ask you to receive the 1938 Nobel Prize. Stockholm Concert Hall, December 10th, 1938. Quite a day. Enrico Fermi was a scientist scientist. Only a few years later, I, little Richie Feynman, would enjoy the great pleasure of working beside this great man. He planned his escape from Europe ahead of time. After the ceremony, he and his wife, Laura, slipped away, sailed the Atlantic, and waved to the Statue of Liberty in New York. My New York. Like all immigrants, the families were asked to take an aptitude test. They were asked to add 15 and 27, then divide 29 by 2. They passed. <laughs> what Enrico won the prize for was a little bit mistaken. He'd actually split uranium atoms with his slow neutrons, though he didn't know it at the time. Still, given the incredible body of scientific work, he really did deserve the glittering prize, unlike some of the clowns they've picked. For quantum electrodynamics with deep consequences for the physics of elementary particles, I ask you, Professor Richard Feynman of Pasadena, California, to receive the 1965 Nobel Prize. Please, Professor Feynman, have you got just a minute, sir? Listen, buddy, if I could tell you in just 60 seconds what I did to win, it wouldn't be worth the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm a curious character, okay? Very curious. I was born not knowing and have had only a little time to change that here and there. On my way back from Stockholm to Pasadena, I stopped at my old high school in Far Rockaway. I looked up my records and that was very interesting. My grades weren't as good as I remember, okay? <laughs> that was a little disappointing. My IQ wasn't that great either, something like 124 or 126, but that delighted me. Winning the Nobel Prize was no big deal, but winning it with an IQ of only 124, now that's something. I've been back to New York many times during the war and after. When it all ended, I was the first group leader to leave Los Alamos and return to civilization. One day I was sitting in a restaurant on 59th Street and I was looking out the window and began to think about the Hiroshima bomb damage. How far from here is 34th Street? The Empire State Building. All those buildings, apartments, this business is all smashed. And when I saw people building a new bridge or, or a new road, I thought they were crazy. They don't understand. Why are they building new things? It's so useless. Fortunately, it's been useless now for decades, so I've been wrong for decades. I'm glad those other people had the good sense to go ahead and build bridges and roads and so on. You've all heard Bob Seger's lyrics, I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. It's a nice turn of phrase, but it's utterly impossible. There is no way that we cannot know what we already know. Okay, so not that long ago, nuclear physics was an amateur game played by a few score professors and their grad students. Einstein was considered a mathematician, for crying out loud. Nowadays, people call us what we are, if not worse. Society has experienced the power of physics. I used to walk through incredible Los Alamos canyons and ancient Indian ruins with John von Neumann, the great Hungarian mathematician I'd met at Princeton. He gave me an interesting idea. He said, you don't have to be responsible for the entire world that you're in. I developed a very powerful sense of social irresponsibility as a result, which has made me a very happy man. I'm indebted to Johnny for planting that seed. What do I care what other people think? Most people who talk about their work on the bomb, people in the uh, higher uh, echelons, worried about some big responsibility. I worried about no big responsibilities. I was always flittering about underneath. I wasn't famous back then. I didn't even have my PhD when I started work on the Manhattan Project. So imagine March 1939. I'm close to graduating up at MIT, your ordinary undergraduate. Down in New York at Columbia University are Enrico Femi and Leo Salad, your ordinary geniuses. I 
know how hard it is to leave Europe, Lar. The history, the culture, the food. But it's much safer here for a Jew like you, or like me. You'll love New York. Eventually, Professor Zillard. Much sooner. I tell Lara we start an American branch of the family. Eventually. Five years to naturalize, five years as alien, alienated too. Niels Bohr told you about the Berlin experiment? Fission? Yes. It excites my curiosity. It excites my concern. Fission means bombs. Oh, don't jump so fast ahead, Leo. Well, the first step to creating anything in Rico is to conceive it. There is only a remote possibility that fission of uranium would even emit neutrons. How can you call it? If it did, then a chain reaction might occur. But surely you see the... If a chain reaction could be sustained, then it might be possible to construct a device that could... You doubt a chain reaction can be sustained? Not at all. In 25 to 50 years. Einstein says turning fission into useful energy is like shooting birds in the dark in a country where there are not many birds. He said that about useful energy. Newsweek magazine. And what do you suppose he says about destructive energy? I haven't heard. I patented a chain reaction process five years ago. I heard. I assigned the patent to the British Admiralty. You heard that too? To keep it secret from the Germans. We have to withhold discoveries. Ration conversation too. I go. No one must publish anything significant. That's part of my plan. I heard. No public conferences or seminars either. Censorship, I don't like. What's to lie? Practical applications are not our concern. We leave that to engineers and businessmen. Science is science, research is research, and knowledge is knowledge, pure and simple. Rico, our garden of Eden is on the brink of a war bigger than the last. We have to be concerned with everything. There's more to life than science. You sound like a humanist. Is that an insult? We should never censor ourselves. We must always think ahead. Think of the future. If we don't, government will. You'd prefer our lives controlled again? Why don't you think a chain reaction is feasible within a few months instead of a few decades? The chance is too remote. How remote? 10%. If I had pneumonia and the doctor told me there was a 10% possibility I might die, I would get very agitated. What if the chance of Germany destroying us is 10%? Nuts. I think a chain reaction can happen soon. You think it can? Should we flip a coin? Let the Nazis decide which of us is right. Do you think maybe they'd put Heisenberg in charge? Oh, certainly. What do you think Hitler plans to do in Czechoslovakia? Cruise the Danube? <laughs> worship the infant of Prague? Plunder the richest uranium mines in all of Europe? Nuts. 2 August 1939. Dear Mr. President, some recent work by E. Fermi and El Salad has led me to believe that the element uranium could be turned into a new and important source of energy. It may become possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in large amounts of uranium by which vast amounts of power could be generated. This new phenomenon could lead to the construction of bombs. Yours very truly, A. Einstein. Four weeks later, Germany invaded Poland. World War II began. I was beginning graduate school at Princeton when FDR appointed a uranium committee whose recommendations led to the first transfer of money and government involvement in nuclear weaponry. Six thousand dollars. Washington money began trickling down to Princeton and to Columbia too. FDR set the atomic age in motion, but as far as anyone knows, he had a sustained conversation about its political and international involvement with no one. And then Adamson says, the Colonel, well, the same. Adamson says, scientists don't understand the true nature of war. <laughs> On and on, he lectures before concluding. It generally takes two wars to develop a new weapon. So you see, professors, weapons don't win wars. Morale does. Oh, I never knew that. <laughs> Wigner begins, well, that's very educational, Colonel. I've always been under mistaken impression that weapons were essential. That sounds like Since a they're not, <laughs> would you be willing to testify before Congress in opposition to the Pentagon's request for increased <laughs> appropriations? Adamson turns to me and says, how much did you say you need for pencils? <laughs> not pencils, Carl. <coughs> graphite to moderate the neutrons, make them more powerful. You can have it, he says. And out we go, the Hungarian conspirators. Oh, Enrico, we begin at last. What are these little rubber ends? <coughs> Eraser. Why put them on pencils? 
to correct mistakes. Italian pencils have no erasers. <laughs> <laughs> the graphite is on its way. One and a half tons, pure. That's my hands. And the neutron source. Compliments of Eldorado Radium Corporation. They gave you uranium oxide, Leo. Loan, Enrico. But call it tube alloy. Tube alloy? Tube alloy. The British code. Tube alloy. <coughs> what a name. Which should we call our one? <coughs> How about the egg boiling experiment? Hard or soft? We begin uranium graphite assembly immediately. What should we call it? How about the pilot? The exponential pilot? In English, Enrico. It is English, Leo. Meaning? Pilot. Budge. Heap. Pile, Enrico. Pile. <laughs> your vocabulary grows quickly, but your accent shrinks slowly. Why did this lady upset you? She's a fool. But you said she's the dean's wife. A pompous fool. Well, everyone should have their own function in life. Hers is etiquette patrol. <laughs> Would you like cream or lemon in your tea, Mr. Feynman? I'll have both, thank you very much. <laughs> Surely you are joking, Mr. Feynman. Pompous fools drive me up a wall. Ordinary fools you can talk to. Give them a hand, but pompous fools, dishonest fools, putting on airs fools, those I cannot stand. By now you should be used to Princeton, Tiger. Besides, what do you care what other people think? But see, I don't care. When I'm concentrating, all right, like last week's seminar, my advisor tells Vigner about our work, okay, and he's supposed to, but then Vigner tells Russell about it too. And, and who's he? Astrophysicist. But then Vigner tells von Neumann about it also. And, and him? Mathematician, the greatest. But anyway, Vigner says Professor Einstein is going to attend. You know who he is, right? 1921 Nobel. Right. But I thought he was the greatest mathematician. Physicist. All right. So the day before, I'm, I'm getting kind of nervous. And the morning of, I start sweating. And my advisor says he'll take all the hard problems. And then a miracle occurs. Pretty rare for an atheist. I'm writing formulas, focusing on the physics, and my nerves vanish. I'm a fish slipping down current, a board, a bird soaring through space. I'm in my element. All I'm focusing on is the physics, the, the ideas, and it's... Feel better now? Especially with you here. And you're feeling... Like we're apart too much. I mean the lump on your neck. It comes and goes, <laughs> just like my visit. Arlene. It doesn't hurt. You know, my uncle said to rub it with omega oil. What does your doctor say? Finish your dissertation and you'll be the doctor. Bell Lab came through with an offer. You will be home this summer. Maybe. Frankfurt Arsenal came through with one too. So, so you'd consider an army outpost in Philadelphia over a private lab in New York? I'm thinking about it. Think about me. Name one enticement that the Frankfurt Arsenal has that I can't match. Calculating vessel functions. Improving gun turret engineering. And you'd prefer that to me? To the extent that I prefer peace to war. <laughs> <laughs> 